Hello and welcome to a brand new season of Marriage for Better for Worse. I'm Eric O'Coin with our host, Dr. Robert Moeller, Pastor Bob, as we affectionately call him around here. He'll be answering your questions on marriage a little later in the program and it'll be live. The viewer call in line is 888-691-1075 and our topic today is basic ground rules for second marriages. And you can ask Pastor Bob about that and other issues related to marriage. That number again is 888-691-1075. Now, as most of you know, Dr. Moeller is not a psychologist, therefore he doesn't offer psychological advice. However, he does have an extensive pastoral and counseling background and is well qualified to offer practical and spiritual counsel using the Bible as his source of direction and wisdom. Pastor Bob, it's been a while since we've been live doing this program. This is a red letter night. Eric, this is an exciting evening. It's been 18 months. It's wow. been a year and a half since we were live on the Total Living Network. And that's primarily because of financial restrictions and difficulties uh, required us to be in a season of reruns, which lasted right. almost a year and a half. But tonight marks the beginning of a new commitment on the part of the Total Living Network and a new beginning for us uh, mm -hmm. producing programs trying to speak to people's needs as it comes to marriage and, and relationship problems from the perspective of Scripture. So it is good to be back. Yes. A little later in the program, we'll tell you about some of the financial considerations that Pastor Bob alluded to, uh, and how you can be involved and assure that the program continues on live and, and in special production that we've got coming up in the next few months. It's very important. We'll tell you more about that. But uh, why don't we take some questions and, and get right into the program. And remember again, we are live tonight, L-I-V-E, live. -E live. And uh, so you can go to the phone anytime and call, and hopefully we'll get to your call and we'll be able to answer it. Uh, on the air. All right, let's take some questions. This one came in via email from uh, Evelyn, who lives in San Francisco, and she writes, Dear Pastor Bob, I've been married for 30 years, but for four years I've been living in the U.S. My husband has been living in our home country. We both have had affairs and agreed to file for divorce. My boyf boyfriend has proposed to me. I love him, but I also still love my husband. What should I do? Well, as simple as I can make that for you, Evelyn, uh, the scripture says in uh, Matthew 19, these are the words of Jesus, the architect, the designer, the creator of marriage, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Mm -hmm. um, I think the fact that you and your husband have both uh, entered into other relationships and uh, have gone on and, and basically are living outside your marriage vows, well, I, I think that's a mistake that probably sooner or later you're going to regret. Because true love, the kind of love that I think you're probably seeking, is a love that's built on character and not emotions. It's a love that's built on promises rather than infatuation. It's a, it's a love that is built upon desiring the very best for the other person instead of asking what's in it for me. You know, Evelyn, here's my fear is that you're going to go from one relationship to another, to another, to another. And that the love that you've really been seeking, you're not going to find. And the reason is, is that it's not grounded in what the scripture requires for love to be, which is uh, a, uh, a reflection of the very character of God. You see, l everything about God is permanent. His love is permanent. His word is permanent. Heaven is permanent. Everything about God is enduring. And when he created marriage, he gave also to us as human beings the gift of permanency, that we would make a commitment to one another before him, that we'd leave our father and mother, be united, become one flesh, and it would be a permanent relationship because it would reflect who God truly is. When you say that you still love your husband and he still loves you, well, if that's really true, then the first and foremost thing you're going to want to do is to honor God. You're going to want to make your relationship a relationship that uh, reflects who God is. 
And the result of that is going to be, he's going to bless you. He's going to give you and your husband, as you honor him, he's going to give you a love for each other, a connection, a depth of intimacy, which is what you've really been seeking, um, I believe, your entire life. Can I just be blunt with you? You need to break off this relationship with your boyfriend. Um, it's what the Bible calls adultery. Uh, you're living uh, with somebody who is not your husband, and, and he's doing the same. And that can never, in the end, there's a simple moral principle. You can't do the wrong thing and have it turn out right, and you can't do the right thing and have it turn out wrong. Could I suggest that both of you, you and your husband, start over, renew your marriage vows, but this time make Jesus Christ the center of your relationship? If you're wondering how to do that, let me just uh, refer you to uh, a, a, a website, www.needhim, or 1-888-NEED-HIM, the, the phone number, and someone can share with you how you can enter into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. There's still a chance to save this marriage, and believe me, I don't think you'll regret it if you and your husband begin over again, but this time with Jesus at the center. Mm. I want to remind you, we are live tonight. You can go to the phone at any time during this program and give us a call and get in the queue, and hopefully we'll be able to take your call. And speaking of which, we have Maya on the phone from Hayward, California. Hi, Maya, and welcome to the program. What's your question for Pastor Bob? Um, my question is, I'm going through a situation to where my husband is you know, going through adultery situations with these women. Um, he's like been on like online and stuff like that. I've called him a couple times and we have been separated for two and a half years and then uh, he finally came back and then I try to work it out but then he's still going through these girls, you know, girl situations on the phone and stuff like that, sneaking around. So my question is like kind of back up off him, you know, try to get myself together with Lord and stuff and work on my life and I wanted to file for divorce and just see how it goes from there. Like if he changes and really, you know, want to commit to the relationship, then I will be back with him. But then I don't know if that's wrong to do. We do have like two kids and stuff together and stuff. But right now he's still in that want to be with other women type thing. He won't tell me, but I always catch him. So I don't know really what to do. I've been separated already. So I don't know. Right now we're not together period right now. So um, what can you suggest to me what to do to give me good advice? Okay. Well, I think you already said something that's really important, and that is for you to get your own life together with God. That the first and foremost thing you need to do is to surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Ask Him to take over and sit on the throne of your life on a daily basis. You know, we become a believer by admitting that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that heaven is a free gift we don't earn or deserve, that we're separated from God because of our sin, but we believe God, though He hates sin, loves sinners, He loves us. He wants, He has to punish sin, but He doesn't want to punish us. And so He provided Jesus Christ, the only 200% uh, person who ever lived, 100% God, 100% man. And you need to put your faith, your trust in Christ and Christ alone for uh, salvation and ask him to change you from the inside out, to make you the person that he's always desired for you to be. Now that's an essential first step in the reconciliation of your marriage, is that you, because no matter what your husband does, whether he continues in this life of adultery or whether he forsakes it and returns to your marriage, in faithfulness, I want you to put your faith in God, not your husband. I want you to trust God for your future, to take care of you, to be faithful to you. Um, I don't think you can put your faith in people and in men. They will disappoint you. Any human being will fail you in some way or another. But I think that you, first of all, need to take this step. When your husband sees that you have faith in God, that you are a new person, that you're born again, it's going to have a profound impact. He's not going to be able to ignore that. He's going to have to decide to walk away from that, or he's going to have to ask you how he can get what you found in your life. I want to point you to 1 Peter chapter 3, 
which offers you hope this evening. It says, Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. What the Bible promises you is that your husband, uh, you may not be able to talk him into coming home or giving up his pornography or other women, but he will not be able to argue your example. He will not be able to turn his back on who you have become, the gentleness and the quietness of your spirit, the fact that you are living with your faith in God and not in him. The Bible holds out the promise that you can win him without words. Women think they have to use words to bring someone back. No, men are more impacted by people, what people do than what they say. Let me urge you to take that step. Find a church that preaches the scriptures. Find a church that shows you how to grow in Christ and become a believer. And then we can get to the issue of the future of your marriage. But now you will have the power to win him without words. Mm -hmm. When we return, Pastor Bob's going to give us some ground rules, some really basic ground rules for second marriages. We'll be right back. TLN is a donor-supported station, and programs like you just watch are made possible by viewers like you. To donate, please go to tln.com slash donate or call us at 630-801-3857. And welcome back to the first program of our brand new season of Marriage for Better for Worse. We love bringing this program to you. We hope it's a blessing. I know it's a blessing to you. Now, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, we're live tonight, and in our next segment, Pastor Bob's going to take your questions on marriage. You can ask your questions two ways. One, by calling us at 888-691-1075, or you can email us anytime at marriage at tln.com. A new report by the U.S. Census Bureau shows that for those 25 and older, 52% of men and 44% of women were remarried. I guess that means tonight's topic of ground rules for second marriages is pretty applicable. It is, Eric. That is a factor in our society today. It's a reality. But what I often encounter is people that are struggling in their second marriages, many of whom uh, in some cases are so disappointed they're on the verge of despair, while others are in full-blown panic. Did I really repeat the same a mistake over again, have I moved from the frying pan into the fire? Well, a lot of this has to do with expectations, which I think in many cases sometimes are unrealistic. And that's why tonight I want to talk about the rules for a second marriage and some basic ground rules. And here's the basic point I'd like you to understand or consider that, uh, that uh, the rules of a second marriage are likely very different than those of a first marriage. In other words, people often get married thinking that this is just going to be all brand new, just like I was back in high school or college, and for the very first time I'm entering into a relationship, and it's just like pushing the rewind. Except the fact that marriage will likely be far more complicated this time around than the first time. And the reason is you bring a history with you. You have a history of being married to another person, perhaps for several years, and often there's children and relatives and a host of other things that you both bring to this new marriage. For children from a, a first marriage, for example, will need to be acknowledged, accepted, and affirmed. Uh, if there's one area where I see people struggle and, and perhaps come with very unrealistic expectations, it's in the area of children. They either think that uh, they're all going to blend together effortlessly and everyone is just going to become this seamless uh, garment without much effort, 
Or they take the opposite of view that I don't have to relate to these people. These aren't my children. I didn't bring them into the world. They're not my problem. I don't have to uh, deal with this. Either extreme, I believe, is wrong and is going to produce problems. So you're going to have to make your peace with the fact that some ongoing contact with the first spouse will likely be necessary. I mean, we need to get real. If your spouse, current spouse, had children with a previous spouse, there will be contact with that uh, previous spouse over uh, clothes, over support, over school. You get later into life, marriage and other issues, graduation, college. There's going to have to be some contact. So if you're not ready to have your spouse have any contact whatsoever with uh, their previous spouse and there's children involved, well, you're setting yourself up for real turmoil and conflict. Uh, the blending of families will likely validate the old adage that blood is thicker than water. Again, one of the problems that so often people bring to me is my husband is favoring his children over me, or my wife is, is, is letting them get away with things, and, and I think she should be more strict. Well, listen, blood is thicker than water, and that biological parent is going to have, at least initially, a deeper bond and commitment to their biological child than you do, and uh, you just need to accept that fact. Um, you need to respect, uh, the respect from your spouse's children will likely have to be won more than automatically granted. Again, some people go into a second marriage saying, well, now I'm the new parent, they're going to listen to me, they're going to do what I say, I want their respect. Well, it's not that easy. You're a stranger to them in many ways. You're a new adult, a new person in their life. And to simply demand their respect without trying to win it as well is probably going to set up a, a, a rebellion scenario of some kind or another. You, know, you need to win their heart uh, before perhaps you win their obedience. All oh, there has to be a certain level or ground rule of, of, of kids obeying. But let's be honest that if you're a stranger and someone that they have not known, and they may be recovering from the trauma of the divorce that just occurred, it's going to take time, and you're going to have to show them that you care about them and care about their heart and that you can be trusted. You know, uh, the biological parent will likely be the person responsible for disciplining the children. It just needs to be that way, at least initially. Again, it goes back to the matter of who the kids know and who they respect. And a uh, second marriage is not, and I repeat, it is not pushing the delete button, but more like cutting and pasting the old life into the new. You're going to have to bring the two together, and that's going to take work. It's going to take commitment. It's going to take, in some cases, sacrifice and patience, a lot of things to make this work. Because you're not able, and it's unrealistic to think you can just jettison your previous lives and start all over again. Uh, here's a formula I believe that will serve you well in your new marriage. It's Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Can I just urge you to ask God to fill you with His Spirit and to manifest those traits. All of them together are so absolutely vital to building a new life, new relationships, and a family that works, Eric. Mm, very, very good advice. Coming up next, Pastor Bob's going to be answering your questions on marriage live. So the number to call is 888-691-1075. Do it now. We'll be right back. And we are back. We're going to take some calls now, as we've been promising, live. This is a live program. It's good to have you with us. And our first caller is Elisa in Hammond, Indiana. Hi, welcome to the program. It's good to have you. And could we have your question, please, for Pastor Bob? Hi. Um, I was just wanted to ask you, is that a sign um, that my ex-husband keeps coming around? Um, because we had got a divorce and it didn't work out. But I wanted to know, is it a sign that the fact that he keeps coming around like he do? 
Well, let me ask a question. Can I follow up with that a little bit? Um, how long have you been divorced? We've been divorced ever since July um, 12th. So it's just... Uh, 2011. About, and, oh, okay, so it's been about six, eight months? Yeah. Um, when you say he comes around, does he come around basically because he's looking for uh, sexual favors, or is it because he wants to renew the, the friendship or the relationship? What's, when he comes around, what's his purpose? Um, he seems like he'd be interested in that, too, and he also say he, he feels like that I'm still his wife. And uh, has he agreed, or is he open to the possibility of going for counseling or for help? We tried that before when we was going to the church, um, the same little church we was going to at first, yeah. We tried that before. And if I can just ask one more question, what, why do you feel, what was the real reason that you, you divorced, or you feel was the real reason that you, your marriage couldn't survive? Because he was sleeping around. Okay, so he was unfaithful to you. Well, yeah. I think what happens so often, Alicia, is that uh, with the passing of time, uh, men do realize that uh, they're lonely. Uh, they realize that they had something very special in a marriage, that just simply being with other women and going from, you know, one one night stand to another, it, it doesn't satisfy and different fulfill them. And the reason is the Bible says when you get married, you become one. And that isn't just a physical union, that's an emotional and spiritual union. And so I think your husband, when he says, I feel like I'm still married to you, is reflecting, you know, the reality of marriage. Uh, just because we get a divorce, it does not sever that emotional and spiritual oneness that, uh, that was created when the two of you married. Um, what I would do with him is I would set up a number of boundaries to test whether he's looking uh, just out of boredom or curiosity or whatever, uh, frustration, whether he really wants a marriage or not. And I think the first thing I would say to him is, yeah, we can be together or we can have lunch or dinner or supper, but I'm not going to sleep with you. I'm not going to be intimate with you because you're no longer married to me. And I respect myself and I respect what marriage means. So if you're interested in rebuilding a friendship, so am I. But uh, we're not going to be intimate with one another. If he says okay and he comes around and he really does want to just simply rebuild a friendship, the next thing I would do is say, okay, if you're really interested in um, taking our, the next step toward restoring our marriage, uh, let's go to church together. Let's worship together. Uh, let's uh, make it a regular habit, perhaps to even get into a Bible study uh, with, with each other and see if we can't grow in God. And then um, if he takes those steps and he's sincere in that, then I think I would say uh, let's take the next step then of uh, going and, and talking to a pastor who understands what marriage is and who could, could counsel us who could perhaps help us build our marriage on a brand new basis other than just emotion or attraction. You see, if your husband is truly interested in more than just getting favors for you, he will fulfill those uh, steps. And you can go through the steps of bonding or rebonding with one another again. And eventually you could start out, perhaps remarry, on a brand new basis than what you did before. So um, in this case, it's really uh, the proof is in the pudding. The proof is whether or not he is a changed man or he's just bored, lonely, or, or uh, amorous and, and wanting uh, favors from you. It, it, you set up these tests for him and see how he acts and how he reacts. If he says, no, I'm not interested in that, forget it, well, then you have your answer. Were you to get back with him, he'd probably leave you all over again. Mm -hmm. And you've saved yourself that heartache. Yep, indeed. All right, we have another caller on the line. We want to try to get as many as we can tonight on the first live program of our brand new season. Uh, Barbara is calling from Antioch, Illinois. Uh, we welcome you to the program. And what's your question for Pastor Bob? Hi, oh, Barbara, are you there? Oh, I'm sorry, you there? Yes, I watch the program every week. Thank you. 
but you never seem to have uh, any anything on there about older couples. Uh, I'm 68. I'll be 69 next month. My husband and I were married 38 years this past Valentine's Day, and we've been together 40. And this is our second marriage, but uh, I was five years in between. I was only, heck, I was married at 18, divorced at 23. We were just very young. And three years ago, he met someone in a grocery store, Dominic's, and uh, lies, lies, lies. And he's never done anything like this. He was about 65, and we're both 68. He's 69 now. but uh, And he's been back and forth and lived with her for, for uh, four months, and then back here again, back there again, and uh, uh, I don't know whether to get a divorce or not. My heart is broken, and uh, I'm trying to, I'm very nervous about this call, but I don't know what to do. I mean, I'm getting older, and I have medical problems, and I'm, I'm not worried about that. My heart is just heavy, and I, I do go to church, the Lutheran Church here in Antioch, and I have tried everything you suggested, but he's been back and forth, and there's nothing here. And today, I saw something with him and her that I should never have seen. He comes up here and, and takes the trash out for me, you know. But I love the man very much, but I don't know what to do now. This has been three over three years, and I just uh, I can't take it anymore. I don't know what to do. I don't want to get a divorce. I love him. If I had to get a divorce, I'd be doing it because I love him. I want him to be happy, and I don't know what you can, what you. Well, I don't know what to do. I think I know the answer. This isn't going to work out for us. I think he's in love with this other woman who's 16 years younger than he is and 16 years younger than me. But I don't know what you do. I just need some help. Okay. Um. Well, I can see that you do love him, and obviously you don't want the marriage to end. But allowing him to come and go, just like with the last caller where I was talking to her, allowing him to come and go is the worst thing that you can do because it allows him to have the best of both worlds. He can, uh, or so he thinks, where he can uh, assuage his conscience by coming home and taking your garbage out, and then he can go back and be involved with this other woman. Um, as hard as it is, you have to protect your own heart, and this is destroying your heart to have him continually doing these type of things. You see, real love is making people face the consequences of their behavior. Real love is bringing them face to face with the reality of what they're doing. And as long as someone can still have access to you or even to your emotions, they aren't having to face the fact that they are violating a sacred and holy covenant which God has established. I don't know whether your husband is afraid of getting older or afraid of dying or thinking that somehow uh, some younger woman is going to give him a new lease on life, but the chances are the reality is that when it comes to the end of the day, he's going to be alone. He's, uh, there's going to come a point where this woman's not going to want to take care of him in his older age. She's not going to want to be burdened with someone who has medical problems. And the chances are she's going to leave him, kick him out, or be done with him at some point. And he's going to end up all alone. Uh, he's trading away someone very precious, someone committed to him, someone that I believe would stay with him all the way to the nursing home and beyond. And you need to tell him that. And you need to just be very honest with him that really what he's doing is trading away uh, true love, true commitment for something that is very passing and transitory in his life. Um, you need some, but, but, but please, do not continue to allow him access into your life or into your emotions. You need to draw a line with him and say, it is her or me. And if you make this decision that it's her, then it is her. And uh, when she finally grows tired of you and when she finally throws you out or finds someone else, um, then at that point you're going to realize what a terrible mistake you've made. 
But can I assure you that God is with you today? He has said he'll never leave you or forsake you. And I want you to hold on to that promise. Um, I want you to call out to him and ask him to make himself known and real to you so that you can find the comfort and the strength you need uh, day by day. Eric? It's hard decisions, hard choices, but Absolutely. she really needs to do that. All right, we have another caller on the line. I think it is Jeremy in Michigan City, Indiana. Okay, good. Welcome to the program, Jeremy. Uh, you have a question for Pastor Bob. Yes, um, my uh, a girl, my girlfriend, not one, you know, my girlfriend uh, of uh, 13 years. Actually, it's my wife. You know, now that she's filed for a divorce and we're still kind of living together and together, I kind of look at look at it in my mind as my girlfriend. Uh, she told me that she wanted to file for a divorce because she felt like she was settling. And I know that might sound strange after 13 years, but uh, this is, you know, this is my problem. And I, I honestly, I, I need to know kind of what to do here, you know. Yeah. So you are married now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're still married. But she filed for a divorce. It's not complete yet. Mm -hmm. But. When she says she's settling, does she have some other man in her life now? I have no idea, sir. Okay. I have no idea, Pastor. Why does she feel that uh, she's settling to have you in her life? Has um, she explained that? I believe. I, no, she didn't. I believe that she's that she has some idea of what she deserves or or what have you. Um. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Well, you know, the fact that when someone says they're settling for another person, um, really what they're saying is uh, they think that they're uh, better than you are, that they're somehow superior, that they're somehow more attractive or intelligent or, or whatever, and that uh, they could find someone else that's, uh, uh, that's going to meet their criteria. Can I just simply tell you that that's pride? And uh, I might even add that it's foolish pride because uh, the truth of the matter is um, I'm not better than some other person. I'm not superior to some other human being. I don't deserve, you know, some special, special person because I'm such a special person. The truth of the matter is your wife feels, and I don't know where she's gotten this. Maybe it was her upbringing. Maybe it was her influence or her home. She doesn't feel that she's worth very much, even though she claims just the opposite. I believe her problem is that she doesn't feel that she has any value and that uh, somehow another man will give her that sense of value that she's been missing. Um, Jeremy, let me suggest that you go to the Internet if you have access to it. I want you to download something. It's called fathersloveletter.com fathersloveletter.com. It's all one word. And it's all the statements in like a letter from God to you or a letter to your wife of how much he values us. Because listen, if I get my value or your wife gets her value from someone that she thinks is special, that person can take it away from her just as easily as he gave it to her. The only way we can truly have lasting value in a sense of of uh, being important or, or being cared about is if we have that relationship from God himself. So I want you to start, if you would, Jeremy, by downloading that letter, fathersloveletter.com. I want you to read it every day till you believe all that it says about your value. And then I want you to challenge your wife that this is how God feels about her. And perhaps that will get through because her problem, again, is not that she feels she's better than you but that she feels she has no value and she needs some man to give her her value. Any man that can give you your value can take it from you, as can any woman. She's on the wrong track. You need to point her toward a heavenly father that values her more than she can possibly imagine. And that may possibly break this whole cycle and save your marriage. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to squeeze in one more quick call. Anita is on the line in Oakland, California. Hi, Anita. Welcome to the program. And could we have your question very quickly? Yes. I'm just calling because um, I wanted to find out. 
I wanted to find out about, I have been married seven years, and uh, my husband has been on these lines with these calls and stuff, and we had a lot of fights behind, a lot of things. I finally got a um, legal legal separation from him. Uh, I want to try to go back and make this work the fifth time, and it just didn't work. So now I've let the marriage go, and I've asked for a divorce. He won't divorce me. Uh, so I found a friend, and he's a minister, and he loves the Lord like I love the Lord. And uh, we we talk and we we fast a lot. But I want to know: Am I right to to go forward with the relationship, or what should I do? Okay, it's a good question, Anita. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Um, has your husband been unfaithful to you? Uh, yes. On, on several occasions? Yes. Okay, so there's a history of unfaithfulness. Um, is, is he a believer or an unbeliever? Uh, he's, um, he's one of those, uh, those things, people that would have, <laughs> um, I don't know, he's, he's not the same religion as me. I'm Christian. Okay. And he doesn't want out of the marriage, however. But you do. No, but he's playing on my. He's playing on my 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 belief that because I'm a Christian, he's playing more on that. And that all of a sudden he wants to pray. All of a sudden he wants to do things, but he doesn't want to stop what he's been doing. Yeah. Well, let me start by saying. Let me answer the question if I can quickly about you and this other minister. As long as you are still married, you're not available. You're not available to enter into an emotional relationship. You're not enter, available to enter into a sexual relationship. You're not available to begin something new with someone else when, in fact, you're still married. God is not going to bless that. God is, is not in that. Um, that's, first of all, just what the scriptures have to say. The second thing is, um, it's very likely that you're in a rebound mode, meaning you've been through this difficult experience with your husband. You're now rebounding and finding someone else that you think might be a better fit. I found that people need a significant amount of time between when one marriage ends and another begins to really search their own hearts, ask the question, what went wrong? Was there anything I contributed to it that um, I, should have, uh, I should have changed? There's a whole number of reasons. I would back out of this relationship with this minister or whatever, and instead I would concentrate on resolving the issue, if you can, with your husband. If he is willing to go to counseling, if he's willing to explore your faith, if he's willing to be challenged to become a believer, I think that's the route to go rather than getting rid of him. I don't know what he's going to do or say. But before you give up on the marriage, I believe you need to see whether or not the two of you could be reconciled in Christ. And I would definitely back out of whatever emotional entanglements you're ending, uh, entering in with someone else. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back with more answers to your questions on tonight's live show right after this message. TLN is a donor-supported station programs like you just watch are made possible by viewers like you. To donate, please go to tln.com slash donate or call us at 630-801-3857. Welcome back. We've got some more questions coming up in just a minute. But first, Pastor Bob wanted to share something very important with our viewers. Well, as Eric has told you this evening, this is our first live show in 18 months. The reason that our program went into reruns some year and a half ago was just the financial pressures and restrictions uh, that we encountered at the Total Living Network. Yet, in a step of faith, uh, the management of the Total Living Network, seeing the need for this program, hearing from viewers like you how important it is, in fact, we kept receiving phone calls and emails week after week from people even though we were no longer live. It just goes to show, we believe, how important this program is to people who are searching for answers about what marriage is meant to be by God's plan. Can I ask you, and this is in all sincerity now, can I ask you if this program is meaningful to you, if you are pleased that we're back 
in a live mode now. Um, would you be willing to make a sacrificial gift to this station, to this program specifically? Um, we have approximately a year in order to uh, build the donor base that we need to keep this air on the program or it's going to fade away again. It's going to go away. But we do have this window of opportunity that we ask you to take advantage of. Tonight, would you make a $50 gift or a $25 gift or a $10 gift? Actually, no gift is too small for us to be grateful for and to make a difference here. You know, some um, programs I know misuse appeals. Um, some uh, in the media are always uh, pulling a fire alarm, always wringing their hands, always threatening that this is it. If you don't give to me, it's all over. We're not doing that this evening. We are coming to you and telling you in a very straightforward fashion, we need to raise about 8000 a month or $100,000 a year to pay for this program. And if we could, for example, have 10,000 people each give $10 just once, we know that we could keep this program coming to you um, and, and ministering to people throughout the nation. If 5,000 people gave 20 or if 2,000 people gave $50, uh, we would be able to reach our goal. So this evening, if this program ministers to you, if you believe it's important that we answer with God's Word as our foundation, the Gospel of Christ being what we stand on, then I want you to consider um, making a gift. And Eric's going to tell you how you can do that. Well, there's three ways. The first one is right there on your screen. Give by phone. Toll-free number is 866-868-7720. Special number you can call to make your donation. You can also go online at tln.com. When you're there, click on the marriage program page, and then you'll see a red donation button. All you do is press that, and you'll be led to a page where you can make your donation. Thirdly, you can use good old snail mail. Just write to us, address it to TLN slash marriage at our mailing address at TLN, which is 2880 Vision Court, Aurora, Illinois, 60506. Three ways you can do it. However you do it, do it now. In fact, do it tonight. We really need to hear from you. It's very important that we can continue the program live and pre-taped as we've been doing so we don't have to go into reruns. We're looking forward to your response. Eric, can I add one other thing? Mm -hmm. Uh, the last 15 minutes of this program and the next 45 minutes, there will be live people that you can call who will take your commitment or your pledge. We have people that will be here waiting for you to call this evening. Again, if you want this program to continue, if you feel of its value, if you're committed to its message, then we need you to step up and make a contribution tonight. Okay, we have just a couple of minutes left before we have to go, so Pastor Bob, here's a couple of email questions. First one came in from Monica in San Francisco who said, I am a very disrespectful wife to my husband. What is respect, and how can I learn to respect my husband? Well, the Bible tells us that wives are to respect their husbands the way the church respects Christ. Uh, just as husbands are to love their wives the way Christ loves the church. Well, what does the church do to show respect? Well, it, uh, it uh, shows honor, doesn't it? It ascribes worth. In fact, that's where we get the word worship from. Do you show your husband, do you communicate that he is of great value and worth to you? Um, the uh, church witnesses to their love to their husband or to Christ. Do you tell others that you admire your husband? that you love him, that he's a, a remarkable man. Um, the church often uh, praises Christ, doesn't it? Do you ever build up your husband? Do you ever tell him uh, all his good qualities? Do you ever um, really take time to lift out the very best in him? I could go on and on, but just think of all the different ways the church honors Christ and say, how could I do that in a similar fashion with my husband? I, you know, one of the definitions of respect I have is this, that you believe in your husband more than anyone else on earth does, that you have faith in him and believe in him more than anyone else does. And if you are willing to say that and live that, he is going to feel respected by you. You know, disrespect, it not only degrades your husband, it degrades you. 
And so let me just say you need to repent of that. You need to ask God's forgiveness. All right, we have one last email we're going to try to squeeze in. It's uh, anonymous, and it says, Dear Pastor Bob, my dad abused me as a child, and my mother never sought help for me. This has created problems in my own marriage. I mistreat my husband, and he doesn't deserve it. Now my dad is sick, and my mother expects me to take care of him. I've forgiven my father, but I don't want to be around him. I do still have some resentment for both my parents over what happened. Now what should I do? Really quickly, there is a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. In Mark 11, it says, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him that your fa Heavenly Father may forgive you your sins. You do need to release your father from the moral debt that he owes you. However, that is different from reconciliation. For reconciliation to occur, there has to be an acknowledgement of the truth. Your mother and your father have to be willing to admit to the following five things. I call them the five R's. I've shared them in other programs. He needs to take responsibility for what he did. He needs to admit that he abused you. Number two, he needs to show remorse for that, to say that he is truly sorry for the pain he caused you. Number three, he needs to make a request. He needs to apologize and ask you if you will forgive him for the great sin that he, he committed against you. There needs to be repentance. He needs to say, I would never do that again. And there needs to be restitution, where he says, what can I do to make this up to you? Your mother apparently, for whatever reason, kept quiet, did not face this, did not get you the help. You need to reconcile with her in the same way. If neither of them are not willing to reconcile and to go through these five steps, I'm not certain that it would be healthy for you to be taking care of your father. I'm not sure that it would be uh, possible for you to be in that day-to-day -day situation without that literally tearing you up on the inside. You need to share with your mother and your father the five hours of reconciliation. If they're willing to work through this process and you might need a third party to help you through it, then I believe it's possible for you to put this behind you to be able to move on in your life and possibly even be able to respond to their needs. Uh, you need to forgive them, that's unconditional. But reconciliation and being put in a place where the pain is relived all over again, that's not healthy for you. It needs to be resolved and you need to tell your parents what the bottom line is. And that brings us to the end of the program. My, the time has really flown, but I'll tell you what, it's been great to be back with you in a live capacity on the program. And we'll be doing that every three w weeks or so. And then we'll have pre-taped programs in between. We'll tell you how that all works. But here's the good news. You can call the number on the screen for phone calls and leave your contact information. We'll get back to you so you can be a part of any of the programs, whether it's live or whether it's a pre-taped program. But it's been a joy to be back. It's so much fun, and I'm looking forward to us not only doing this year, but years to come. And don't forget, we really need your support now as we're in this new season. It's so important that we have a gift of support from each and every one of you. If you believe this program is worth carrying on, now is the time to be involved. Thanks for being with us. It's been great. I'm Eric O'Coin, and for Bob Moeller, good night. God bless you. We will see you next week at the same time. Thank you for watching. The program you just watched is made possible by viewers like you. We would like to thank you for your continued support. To donate, please go to tln.com donate or call us at 630-801-3857.